So I find Chrissy Cunningham so compelling. I find her relationship with Eddie super compelling, her trauma, her death scene. And it's like five total scenes, maybe four and a half. And I'm super invested. I'm rooting for her, I'm rooting for Eddie. And then she dies, and it's not just horrifying because of how it happens, it's actually sad. And all this is built up in like 10 minutes of screen time, but they really use every second. It's really impressive. So I want to go through all five of Chrissy's scenes, talk about Max's brief interaction with her and what's going on there, talk about Eddie's connection with her and everything that's going on there, and then Chrissy Vecna. And see if we can induce some principles here on how to write a character you're gonna kill immediately. So let's take these first two scenes together. Quick scene. Scene one is the pep rally. We see this Chrissy, this Chrissy, and this Chrissy. And then scene two is like three seconds long, but it's this. Look at her. Contradiction, right? What is going on here? This character is not as happy as we expect her to be, given what seems to be a pretty good life. She's the queen of Hawkins. She's got the cheerleader dating the basketball star thing going on. She's in love. Why this total 180? Why happy and then suddenly sad? Why was she visiting the school counselor. And if we choose to connect the dots here, we'll notice that she's leaving the guidance counselor's office looking troubled, which means the counselor couldn't help her. Whatever's going on here must be pretty serious. And scene three, they draw out this contradiction beautifully. Chrissy's discomfort or shame or whatever it was that we're seeing turns to something almost like aggression. Are you deaf? I said go away! And it's clear she's really trying to hide something from everyone around her. And aggression in particular is an emotion that really embellishes this contradiction. We just met this person, but we can already identify this as uncharacteristic for Chrissy. And before we go to the actual content of the scene with Vecna and everything, just take note of the emotions we experience here in these first three scenes with Chrissy. We start off with joy and romance, then we quickly get anxiety or shame or pain or however you want to identify this, then frustration or maybe even anger, then confusion and fear, really, really extreme fear, debilitating fear, and then it's all over and we're confused again, we're relieved, we survived. Okay, pause. So what fundamentals can we get from this so far? Rule number one, prioritize strong hooks, promises, and problems. As if this isn't always important, it totally is, but with a character you're gonna kill off in the first episode, you really only have one shot to get the audience's attention, and you better use it. Create a strong question we want answers to, create a serious problem that needs to be solved, and most importantly, we get a promise to, a promise that will get answers. And that comes in the form of glimpsing things that we expect to get a fuller picture of soon, and it comes in the form of a character who is just as curious as we are, who also wants answers. And this prevents the contradictions from just being confusing, like we're missing something. Rule number two, take us on an emotional journey. Even just up until now, we've been through about a dozen emotions alongside Chrissy. We've experienced her outer world, her inner world, feelings she's trying to hide, memories that scare her, personal secrets, deep trauma, pain, terror, horror. We've gasped in fear with her, we've screamed, we've sighed with relief when we come out on the other side intact. And it's been, what, like five minutes? Going through that intense of an experience with a character invests us. It creates a bond, familiarity, concern. If we stop watching here or here, we'd be like, Chrissy who? But if we stopped here, we'd be lying in bed like, huh, I wonder what ended up happening to that cheerleader character. Rule number three, start late. And this is a rule you often hear with short stories, and it applies equally to these littler stories within your bigger stories. You want to start as late as possible and end as early as possible, which means your story essentially is going to comprise just the steps before a climax scene, and then the climax, and then you're done. With Chrissy, we do not start out at the beginning. By the time we meet her, this problem has been going on for days, and then scene three introduces us to trauma that's been going on for years. Again, we just have no time to waste here, and we can put two and two together ourselves, so no reason not to start with a story already advanced, things already at their breaking point. Okay, now onto the content of scene three, the bathroom scene. Here we learn all about Chrissy's trauma, except no we don't. They don't tell us what the trauma is. We get hints, we get a specific relationship, has to do with her mom and her mom's emotional abuse. We get an implication of a subject matter, body image stuff, and just from this we can put together a much fuller picture ourselves. Mom is overbearing, mom has a temper, mom gave daughter insecurities about being fat, even this position she's in might be meant to either imply or at least make us associate to eating disorders. So rules four and five take advantage of archetypes and their resonance. Archetypes help you condense the amount of narrative you need to build. We're not constructing a story from scratch here that no one's ever experienced before. Popular girl with body image insecurities, maybe an eating disorder, that is a story we know. And once we realize that this story is that story, we already have our whole little suitcase of emotions that come along with it automatically. Sympathy, empathy, concern, whatever it is. And again, this is about freeing up space. We have main characters whose stories we need to tell. So associating these bit characters strongly with archetypes helps us free up the space to do that. Contrast that with a character like Eleven, who's less archetypal, who they want the audience to have more of a nuanced relationship with, but it's okay, she's a main character, we have time for that. With Chrissy, we don't. Rule number five, subtly create dynamics you will immediately play with. Okay, weird formulation, but here's what I mean. Scene three's main function is introducing Vecna. It's secondarily about introducing Chrissy's trauma, but within the vehicle they use to accomplish both of these is this dynamic that powerfully frames the next scene. What am I referring to? Look at this. Please just go away. Are you deaf? I said go away! Go away! Go away! Go away! Get out of here! And what's the next scene about? You know, you're not what I thought you'd be like. Mean and scary? <laughs> yeah. Well, 
I actually kind of thought you'd be kind of mean and scary too. <laughs> Scene 3 is about Vecna and trauma, but the dynamic at the forefront is Chrissy pushing everyone away. Even the form her trauma takes is about her not letting her mom in the door. You hear me? Open the goddamn door, Chrissy! This is a character who distances herself from people. This is a character who's isolated, who's lonely. And then the next scene is all about her letting someone in, letting them get close, not pushing them away, allowing them to alleviate, if not the primary pain of her trauma and the curse, at least the secondary pain from the isolation that has resulted from this. And this segues into scene four. Eddie reciprocates perfectly in this role. I love how he doesn't seem to plan on helping her until he realizes that she's in pain. And the way he helps her is showing her that she is not alone at all in this experience. Do you ever feel like... You're losing your mind. Uh, you know, just on a daily basis. He shows her that they've already kind of had a bond of some sort for a while, and he even tries to explicitly identify her with his own moniker. Right? With a name like that, how could I forget? I don't know, you're a freak. And we see this joining of their storylines, he plans to help her. And how, how is he gonna help her? That's another dynamic they perfectly set up, what's plaguing Chrissy is inescapable. Eddie in the scene is the one helping her to escape. And yeah, I'm talking about the drugs, but even without the drugs, we get the sense that it's the first time in a long time that Chrissy has honestly smiled and laughed. What we saw before seems like a front here, she's not putting on a strong face for anyone. It's just this beautiful moment of her finding relief from her suffering through this new bond she's allowed herself to make. And also keep in mind these two are coming from completely different worlds. They barely belong in the same scene, which makes this bridge Eddie is forming even more meaningful. He's really reaching far and doing something incredible to help this girl he doesn't know very well. And keep in mind Eddie's personality, he's the super grandiose guy who goes through a lot of effort to make himself small and unthreatening. That is a big gesture from this guy, all because he sees someone is in pain. It's a beautiful scene. And it's not nearly as powerful without previous scenes emphasizing how closed off she was. And now rule number six, I think this is the most important rule of them all by far. The goal here is starting a story that you will not finish. If you want a character's death to be meaningful, meaning if you want it to impact us once a story has taken this person away from us, then we need to feel what we're missing, what we don't get to see. This death has to feel like something is being cut short. So we get this beautiful beginning of a friendship, maybe a romance, and I personally at this moment want to see a whole season about the freak and the cheerleaders budding relationship, fighting off this jock boyfriend, who's a total mouth breather who we don't like at all, so that Eddie and Chrissy can live happily ever after. That's where I'm at with this scene. And then in the next scene, Chrissy dies and Eddie's life is ruined. You cannot cut a story short if you don't set it up to be long. And that's what this scene does. They even set up actual future scenes that we're not gonna get to see. Uh, we play at the hideout on Tuesdays. You should come see us. So if you're gonna kill a bit character, write them as more than that. Write a future that will not happen and then kill them. Rule number seven, make this character subplot the most important thing happening in the story at this moment. So this is coming when the rest of the story hasn't really taken off yet. There's not much else really pressing happening, but Chrissy needs to solve her thing right now. It cannot wait, it's gotten that bad. And we know at this point it's bad, the drug conversation furthers that. It furthers our understanding of just how severely this character is suffering. Do you ever feel like you're losing your mind. That is bad. She's not just afraid, this is driving her insane. And she's about to make this wildly uncharacteristic decision of turning to hard drugs because of this. Innocence is a thing we've already unconsciously started to associate with her, and she's gonna sacrifice that innocence because that is how much pain she's in. And then at the end of the scene we get this. Do you have anything maybe stronger? It is worse than we thought. This problem needs to be solved now. On to Chrissy's final scene. And this scene is so visually horrifying. It's such an intense emotional ride. It's hard with the scene to disengage from the loudness of the horror. These overwhelming aspects of the scene in order to get a broader or deeper perspective of what's going on here. That's what we gotta do. So who is this happening to? We gotta focus, we gotta center ourselves. What is the story of Chrissy Cunningham the story of? So I think Chrissy Cunningham is the story of someone suffering internally. Externally, it all seems to be going just fine, but these types of problems of bad home life, abuse from family members, body image issues, eating disorders, these are internal problems. And the problems that come from inside of us feel inescapable in ways other problems don't. You cannot avoid inner trauma. You can't just not go home when you're a teenager and you have an abusive parent. You cannot run from an eating disorder. And this next part happens to be false, it's part of the sickness, but these problems feel like you can't tell anyone about them because no one understands what you're going through, because it's shameful, because there's a social stigma, and that creates this sense of inescapability from these problems. Nothing I do will get me away from this. No one can help me, that's how it feels. So, now, I'll ask you, what is the horror of Vecna, and is it any surprise that it matches perfectly? Vecna's horror is inescapability. You cannot escape from Vecna's curse. The whole reason why he feels so threatening and how he curses you is the non-interactability of everything about him. He is reaching you on a plane of existence you cannot get to. So you cannot run from him, you cannot escape. The sequence of events that precede him murdering you are this inescapable process. They both died less than 24 hours after their first vision. And I just saw that goddamn clock, so 
Looks like I'm gonna die tomorrow. The visions all present these situations where you physically have nowhere to turn, no one can help you, the exits are blocked off, every inch of space is covered in Vecna evilness of some kind, or in these symbols of inevitability, and, this is my favorite part, every detail of the physical form the last step of his curse takes epitomizes this inescapability. He puts you in a trance that makes people around you practically incapable of reaching you, and then he also puts you physically, literally out of reach as well through the levitation. And then come the breaks, and these are not normal breaks, what's up with how weird and unnatural these types of injuries are. And I think the reason why it's so horrifying is because as onlookers, we can't fathom what's doing it. There was nothing you could see or, uh, or touch. It's not like, oh, Vecna's taking an invisible baseball bat to Chrissy's kneecaps. No, the type of breaks we're seeing are just downright confusing on a visual level. I see this and I don't understand what's physically happening here. The notion of being able to stop it, that's just beyond all hope. Like, I can block a bat to the kneecaps, that's defendable, you can dodge it, you can run, you can wear a knee pad. You cannot block whatever this is. There's no knee pad for your eyes being torn out from the inside. So what we have here is this all-encompassing horror of an inescapable end. This is expressed in Vecna himself in terms of who he targets. Once he curses you, there's nothing you can do to stop him, so we have it on the big picture. Then a level deeper, the form his violence takes bolsters that impact. The visions, the trance, even him slowly walking towards you instead of chasing you. Why should he run if there's nowhere for you to go? And then finally putting you physically out of reach, an invisible force lifting you and torturing you in all these unnatural ways we have no hope of defending against, they don't even make sense to us. And finally, this time not deeper but broader, this is coming in the context of a greater story that's already hyper-focused on the fear and agony of exactly this kind of horror. It is not not one scene about this inescapability thing coming out of nowhere. No, it's been building all this time for us through Chrissy and her story. This is the worst form of what is already plaguing her. And that leads into the final rule here. Chrissy, unfortunately, is not here because we love her. She's here to perform a specific function. Her character's purpose is introducing us to the horror of Vecna. With supporting characters, I like to ask supporting who is supporting what. Chrissy is a support for Vecna. She is antagonist support. And because of that, we see every aspect of who she is geared towards the particular horror that characterizes her murder. So rule number eight, quite simply, is victimhood is a tool just like anything else. Craft the victim, the scene, the method of murder, the story leading up to the murder, setting, pacing, imagery, everything, to fit the emotion you're evoking through the death, or if not an emotion, whatever story goal it is. And I want to show you a great example of this in a non-horror story, just to show you what that looks like. Gangs of New York, one of my favorite movies ever. Plot-wise, it's essentially a revenge story. Bad guy kills protagonist's father, protagonist grows up and wants revenge. But really, this is a story about the growing pains of the modern world. The humanity that in endured the painful process of the old ways of the world being replaced by the new. And you have this character who epitomizes the old world. It's in who he is, a priest, who he aligns himself with. Is this it, priest? The Pope's new army? It's in the tones of how the character speaks. You plague our people at every turn. And of course it's in who he's fighting, what characterizes his enemy. And you, whatever your name is, what is your name? Amsterdam, sir. Amsterdam? I'm New York. It's in the weapon he uses, a sword, this weapon of the old world, and we even hear the sounds of the old world as he dies. <laughs> just a death to incite a revenge plot, they integrate everything. Horror movies traditionally and somewhat superficially do this by having the monster destroy something beautiful or innocent, and Stranger Things is doing that also with Chrissy, but it runs so much deeper here with this motif of inescapability that characterizes everything about her because it characterizes everything about Vecna. Super well executed. Subscribe to the channel, I think we're gonna hit 100k soon, or maybe we already did. Pretty crazy to me, I feel like I have to do something really special, and I have pretty much no idea what to do for a 100,000 subscriber celebration. Tell me any ideas you have. Actually, I do I do have one idea, but it's rather extreme. But if I don't see anything else I like, I guess it'll be that. It might not come for a bit, I would need to physically get to the location first. But yeah, thanks to everybody a ton for the support. Next video, we'll be going back to Arcane. It's the video I mentioned before, comparing something in Arcane to the same thing in Game of Thrones. I'm actually curious if anyone can guess what I'm comparing. It's something I actually can't believe I didn't think of sooner. It's a super interesting topic to me. Support the channel on Patreon. Shoutouts to Weir Westeros and William Morris Julian for the top tier subscriptions. Thank you so much, and thanks to everyone who's given support. Stay tuned for upcoming stuff, and thanks for watching.